So we are going to talk about matrix inverses and how to find them. Now, the idea of elementary matrices and their relationship with row operations is going to be very important in this video. So if you haven't seen my video on elementary matrices, you should watch that first, link in the description, and then come back and watch this video so we can learn about inverses. Now to start off, let's talk about the definition of an inverse. Generally, an inverse is some kind of function that undoes the original function. So if we think about the matrix A, if we multiply our matrix A by its inverse, we should get the identity, because the identity is the matrix that corresponds to no transformation or not doing anything. Now, to start off, I'm going to do a lot of things that don't really make sense at first, but by the end of this video, it'll make perfect sense exactly what I'm doing. To start off, we're going to pick a matrix A, and we're going to define it as 2, 0, 1, 1. And this method, of course, will apply to any kind of square matrix. I'm going to start off by writing A equals the identity times A, which is true because, like I said, the identity doesn't do anything. And then we are going to construct something called a super augmented matrix. Now, you've probably seen the idea of an augmented matrix in the context of Gauss-Jordan elimination, where we put the matrix of coefficients on this side and then a vector of constants on the right side. But in this case, we're going to augment not just by a single vector, but by an entire 2 by 2 matrix, in this case specifically the identity. So again, we've taken our original matrix and put the identity matrix on the other side here to create a super augmented matrix. Now what we're going to do right now, and again this will make sense at the end, is we're going to reduce the left side here, this matrix, down to the identity using row reduction. So to start off, let's say we multiply the top row by a half. So we do 1 half R1 here, and that's going to give us 1, 0, 1, 1 on the left side, and then we do the exact same thing on the right side. So we get 1 half, 0, 0, 1. And we're going to express this in our equation here. What we're going to do is think about this row operation 1 half R1 as some kind of function. We're going to call it F1 because it's the first. F1 of A equals F1 of I times A. So we're just saying if we do this row operation to A, it's the same as doing this row operation to I times A since they're the same. Now we have one more row operation to get to the identity. If we do R2 minus R1 right here, that will get us 1, 0, 0, 1 on the left side here. And then we do the same thing, 1 half 0, and then 0 minus a half is negative a half, 1, right here. We again want to express this in our equation. We can write this row operation as f2, our second function. So f2 of f1 of a equals f2 of f1 of i times a. And now what we know is f2 of f1 of a, this is equal to the identity. Now, we're going to look at the right side of the equation a little bit more, and this is where elementary matrices come into play. Each of these functions corresponds to an elementary row operation, and we know because of our work on elementary matrices that every row operation has a corresponding elementary matrix that has the same effect. So let's look at F1 as an example. F1 is the row operation 1 half R1. We know that we could come up with an elementary matrix E1 that has the same effect as multiplying the first row by a half. In this case, that matrix would be a half, zero, zero, one, because this takes the identity and does one half row one. So if we multiply E1 by IA, it has the exact same effect as doing F1 of IA. So we'll write E1 IA right here. That corresponds to F1 of IA. And then we have F2 over here. Without even finding the elementary matrix, we know, because this is an elementary row operation, some matrix exists, some elementary matrix that corresponds to this row operation. So we can write it as E2. And if we do E2 times this, it's the same as that row operation F2 of our result. And these two things are equivalent. Now, the last thing that we know is that when we multiply matrices, we are allowed to group them however we want. So if we put parentheses around this and do this multiplication first, we'll still get the same answer. Now let's take a look at what we have. We have the identity matrix being equal to some product of matrices times A. 
the identity matrix, some matrix times A. E2, E1, I, this product of matrices is exactly equal to A inverse. So if we want to find the inverse matrix for A, all we have to do is figure out what this product is. And that is why we have this super augmented matrix over here. We started with I, we did 1 half R1, and then we did R2 minus R1. That's the exact same as taking the identity, applying E1, because that's this first row operation, and then applying E2, because that's the second row operation. So this right side of our matrix over here is E2, E1, I, which is A inverse. So in fact, our inverse matrix, A inverse is equal to 1 half 0, negative 1 half 1, right here. This is our inverse matrix. So the reason that elementary matrices are important in this process is because they allow us to see that we can write this set of row operations on the identity as a product of elementary matrices. And therefore, this product is equal to the inverse matrix. So anytime you want to find the inverse of some matrix here, you want to augment it by the identity and then row reduce the left side down to the identity matrix keep track of those operations on the right side, and whatever you get coming out here, that is your inverse.